The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Order. Before I call the Honourable Member for Carl Shelton and Wallington to move the motion, I would like to inform members that the Parliamentary Digital Communications team will be conducting secondary filming during today's debate for their series of procedural explainers. Welcome. Uh, Elliot Colburn to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Dowden. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I beg to move that this House has considered e-petitions 631529 and 630932 relating to LGBT plus content and the relationships and sex education curriculum. If I be can begin, as usual, by reading out the prayers of these petitions, the prayer of e-petition 630932 reads, and I quote, We believe kids shouldn't learn about this at an early age. I'm sure there's many parents who do not want their or other children taught about LGBT in primary school. The petition was closed on the 12th of July last year with 249,594 signatures, including 490 from Carl Shorten and Wallington. And I do just want to clarify, because this petition did receive some attention for the start, uh, for the, for, because of the person who started this petition, just to clarify that they were a UK resident and therefore the petitions committee felt that it was appropriate to schedule this petition, um, uh, Mr Dowd. The prayer review petition 631529 reads, and I quote, We believe kids should learn about this at an early age. I'm sure there are many parents who want their and other children taught about LGBT issues. There is a petition to remove this content, which we believe is discriminatory. LGBT plus people exist. They have the same rights as the rest of us, and kids should know them without judgment or issue, despite what their parents might believe. And this petition was closed on the 20th of July 2023 with 104,920 signatures, including 151 from my Carl Shorten and Wallington constituency. Now, in their reply to these two petitions, the government stated that it had no intention of revising its guidelines, but had since, uh, has since commissioned a review into relationships and sex education, or RSC as I will refer to it throughout the rest of this debate. And I want to make the case today as to why we should not go backwards, not allow a return to the days of Section 28, and put forward the positive case for an inclusive, age-appropriate RSC curriculum, which I think this is a policy the government should be proud of, rather than backing away from. But first of all, I wanted to share a little bit of my own story. Now, I was at school before mandatory RSC, and certainly before LGBT plus inclusive RSC. Now, I came out very early in my secondary school career at Carl Shorten Boys Sports College to a few select peers and staff that I trusted. Now, if this had happened in the days of Section 28, I would, of course, would have had to have been turned away by my teachers and told to shut up about it. Instead, I was part of a school that was well ahead of its time and not only taught us about healthy relationships and safe sex, but also to make sure, make sure that that was inclusive of all identities, including LGBT plus people like me. Now, I want to be clear, this was not some graphic exposure of how to have sex or the various things that people might want to do with each other behind closed doors. It was simply that LGBT plus people existed, 
that they can form loving relationships with each other just like any other person, the precautions they should take, but also how to access specific advice and support if we needed it. That was it. Now, I want to set out the current framework for RSE in England, and I want to thank the House of Commons Library, Brooke, the Sex Education Forum, and others for their helpful briefings in advance of today's debate. Now, the government RSE guidance of 2019 advises schools to plan a developmental and age-appropriate curriculum. Relationships education is therefore approached in ways that are relevant to the age and maturity of the pupils. For example, when teaching about families and people who care for me in primary school, this can be an opportunity to talk about the fact that some people have two dads and some have two mums. And key messages taught throughout relationships education include that people do not have to conform to narrow stereotypes and that discrimination, bullying and prejudice is harmful and wrong. And indeed, that is a principle that is woven throughout the British values element of school teaching, which is that they encourage and foster respect, kindness, equality and inclusion. These are British values and they are intrinsic to the ethos of most schools and families are supportive of. Now, primary schools are not required to teach sex education or explicitly teach about LGBT plus issues. It is more about families and relationships. And parents also have the right to withdraw their child from the sex education part of RSE up to the age of 16. Now, a whole school approach is what the government asks of our schools as a vehicle to deliver strategies, for example, to tackle violence against women and girls, sexual harassment, which as we know from reports from Ofsted is rife, peer-on-peer -peer abu peer -peer abuse, bullying, forms of hatred such as racism and religious abuse, and much more. So my concern would be that to remove LGBT plus content from relationships education would conflict with schools already or, or with the school's existing obligations under the public sector equality duty and community cohesion duties and undermine the government's strategies to deliver on both of these. LGBT plus people, with 38% reporting that their RSE failed to provide any or adequate information about sexual orientation and 44% reporting that it failed to provide anything or adequate coverage of gender identity and information relevant to trans people. And I just wanted to share a couple of quotes from some of these young people, one of which who said, we need to be told more about LGBT. I'm a lesbian growing up and I never knew that you could have sexual diseases from same-sex um, activities until the age of 15 when I started myself. Educate children, this is another quote, educate children on the LGBT plus community and same-sex relationships. There will be someone in each class that it will be relevant to, and children should learn to be more accepting. Queer people have and always have existed, and children should be taught. Now, in addition to learning at school, children are learning, of course, about relationships from their families, communities, and the wider media. And the Sex Education Forum surveyed over 1,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 17 and found that they were more likely actually to have learned about LGBT plus identities from social media, around 30%, than they would at school, just 25%, with parents identified as the main source for learning for just 4% of respondents. And this leads me on to a key point that I want to make in this debate. Rather than going after LGBT, LGBT plus identities as part of the government's review into RSE, I would urge the government instead to focus on the quality of the content and the resources available to schools and the training available to teachers to provide it in a safe and age-appropriate way. Because again, research has demonstrated back in 2018 that only 20% of teachers said that they felt extremely confident delivering inclusive RSC, with 10% reporting that they were not confident at all. And a later survey conducted in 2019 by the NSPCC and the NEU found that almost half of teachers said that they did not feel confident delivering the statutory RSC. Now, since it became statutory, the government has invested around 3.2 million of its planned 6 million pounds uh, to implement the statutory RSC curriculum. But this is only a fraction of what schools say that they need to do so safely, which sits at a best estimate of around 29 million pounds. So the voices from these students and teachers are clear. They need the tools to be able to deliver this effectively and appropriately, which is what I hope the government's review will focus on. Now, I do want to address some of the criticisms surrounding an inclusive RSE policy, but especially the um, area of parental oversight and engagement and the appropriateness of materials used in the classroom. Now, the government has made a number of statements recently about parents' right to see 
RSE materials in a way that suggests that this is somehow new. But of course, that is not the case. Schools have always been encouraged to share RSE resources with parents and carers. I will gladly give way. I've got a constituent um, whose the school will not show the materials. They'll show a summary, but not the actual materials. So she's taken her child out of the school. Now, I, I agree we need complete transparency. I think that parents have got a right. Um, do you agree with that as well? Absolutely. And if the school has done that, then that, in my view, is contrary on current government guidelines. And I think that that is absolutely appropriate. Um, so I, I do not disagree with her at all. On that, the government's own statutory RSE guidance, guidance outlines obligations for parents and carers to be consulted on the development and review of schools' RSE policies. And as part of this process, the guidance explicitly states that parents and carers should be able to see examples of the resources the schools will use. And many schools should, um, should be asking parents and carers to actually come in, view the materials, and have a chat about the context in which they will be used with them. That's there in black and white. So if that isn't happening, that absolutely, should, um, that absolutely should be called out. I don't think anyone would disagree that parents have a right to know. Now, in regards to some of the accusations of extreme, inappropriate, highly sexual material or similar, there simply isn't the data to back up many of these claims, including a lack of any statistical data from the DfE in terms of complaints that have been escalated to them. And many teaching organisations and people representing education unions, for example, have said that they have struggled to find any evidence of this being a widespread problem. I suspect I'm going to come on to both of these honourable members' points. So if I can just finish this bit, and if they still want to intervene on me, I will gladly take it. Many of the examples that have been used have come from other jurisdictions, one from the Isle of Man and many from the United States of America, and others have not been backed up with any evidence. Rather, these have been anecdotal claims. Indeed, a High Court judge ruled in the case of the protests outside schools in Birmingham that the characterisation of what was being taught in schools was being grossly misrepresented. Now, that's not to say that sometimes things don't go wrong. Um, and I will come on to that in a, in a little moment. But the research does suggest that actually the opposite is the case in terms of young people are not being taught key aspects of the curriculum rather than going to the other extreme. Because the sex education's polling of young people aged 16 and 17 found that the basic mandatory aspects of the curriculum, such as healthy relationships and how to access sexual health services, are frequently missed, with close to 3 in 10 young people saying that they had not learned how to tell, for example, if a relationship is healthy. Now again, when providing a universal service like education, it is of course naive to think that sometimes things don't go wrong. And I acknowledge the comments from the Chief Inspector of Ofsted that there have been occasions where this has happened. And there may well have been occasions where things go wrong. Inappropriate things may have been said or brought into classrooms, and that is not acceptable. But there is a framework existing in place to deal with this already, and I do not believe we have to jump to erasing LGBT people entirely to achieve it. I will give way first and then to my honourable friend. <laughs> The Honourable Jonathan has given way. He's given a characteristically powerful um, uh, and important speech. Um, I too have seen uh, myths going around in my own constituency, uh, which is in Wales, um, regarding uh, what is allegedly being taught in schools, which simply don't bear up the facts. And would he agree with me that the very important thing to do is, of course, for, for parents and indeed anybody to be speaking with schools? My, my schools have been working with uh, families and with uh, cross school clusters, actually, to make sure that parents are involved and understanding what's going on. And of course, they can access the information often online. For example, the Welsh Government's curriculum, curriculum is there. For for everybody to read online. So it's important to base on the facts, not on myths that are circulating. The Honourable Member is absolutely right. Um, and of course, it comes, it comes back to the point I've been trying to make throughout this, is that there may well have been occasions where things go wrong, but that's where we need to make sure that schools are engaging with parents and carers and are fulfilling the statutory guidelines like we spoke about and allowing them to see and to develop that curriculum together. Uh, but also that we are having these discussions based on the matter of fact. And I'll give way to my Honourable Friend. Friend, uh, what he said so far, um, he said that there's uh, there's not enough um, there's not enough evidence of this happening. Would he meet with me um, later this week so I can set out all the evidence that we've got, which I've also shown with uh, shared with uh, the Department of Education? Because to say it's not out there is completely and utterly wrong. It is out there. It is out there, and I will be mentioning, the, I will be mentioning in my speech um, all the different companies that are actually sharing this, this material, and I'm afraid some of it is completely abhorrent. 
I'm always happy to meet with my honourable friend. We sit on the petitions committee together, and I'm sure, I'm sure we're happy to have that chat. And as I, I just want to clarify, I'm not saying that it's not out there. I think I, I think I have made that clear so far in my speech, and if I haven't, I do apologise. I just want to be crystal clear. When you're providing a universal service where everybody gets, like education, like health, for example, it is inevitable that sometimes things go wrong. What I'm saying is that there isn't any statistical data to back up that this is a widespread problem. So rather than trying to get rid and erase LGBT people from existence in schools, we absolutely do need to look at why teachers don't feel confident doing it, why in occasions sometimes people do invite inappropriate stuff into the classroom and absolutely i absolutely agree with my honorable friend if things are not age appropriate i will absolutely be there with be there with him that should not be in our classrooms um, it's about how do we make sure that schools feel confident to deliver it and parents feel uh, parents feel empowered as well um, that was the that was the point i was trying to make but um, I, i'm always happy to see my honorable friend and i will give way to the member for brighton kemp town <laughs> Very often a conflation does he not agree with all the material an organisation might produce and the material that is used in schools. You know, Disney produces adult movies and it produces children's movies. The children's movies have children's content, the adult movies have adult content. An organisation might produce adult materials and might produce ma children's materials. Just because the organisation produces a range of materials doesn't mean that that is evidence that they are being used in schools. The evidence is what teachers are doing and what, um, and what children are reporting, which is broadly positive. I, I absolutely agree with the Honourable Member, and, um, and I think he makes a very good point. Of course, many people who produce children's content, for whatever it might be, might also be producing adult content as well. Many authors, for example, uh, write books that are both aimed at children and aimed at adults as well. It's not unusual. Um, so, of course, it does need to reflect what is actually going on inside the classrooms. Um, but, of course, we do need the DfE to be well-equipped to make sure that it has the expertise it needs to ensure that any complaints that do come forward can be thoroughly investigated and, are, and has the adequate resources in place to deal with things when things go wrong, because, again, that is inevitable in a universal service, and I would like to hear a bit more from the Minister about that. But I just want to bring my remarks to an end by focusing in on um, a societal change, if it were, um, from the days of Section 28 and where we are, where we are now. Um, Section 28, of course, being the banning um, of the teaching or the promotion, as it was called, of LGBT plus issues. Now, since those days, of course, we've been, we've been allowed to go on to marry, can obtain a gender re recognition certificate, adopt, and, of course, have gained many other hard-won rights. And this, what does this mean in practice? Well, this means that there will be LGBT plus people at the school gates, dropping off their much-loved children. And are we seriously suggesting to the government that a child will have no ability to discuss why someone has been dropped off by two mums or two dads at the school gate? Of course not. And are we seriously suggesting that in the digital age, for example, when LGBT plus people are allowed to go, out, go about their lives out of the closet and in the knowledge that the state has protections against discrimination in place, are we really suggesting that there's a way of preventing children from finding out that LGBT plus people exist? As we saw in the data earlier, more children still find out from social media than they do from schools or from their own parents. Of course, I'd suggest it would be next to impossible to hide the fact that LGBT plus people exist from children. And the government, I'm afraid, thinks so too. When it came out with its guidance for uh, gender questioning pupils, it, it, it explicitly said that it did not feel as if it was appropriate to continue to ask schools to hide a student who was questioning their gender from a parent because it would be next to impossible for that parent to not find out anyway in the digital age. Now, if the government agrees with it when it comes to gender questioning pupils, I believe it has to be consistent and agree with that when it comes to LGBT content in the RSE curriculum. Because when it's done right, it does have benefits for all. It tackles discrimination, it promotes healthy relationships, and it reduces poor mental health. So I hope that the minister in his reply can offer a categorical assurance that the review will be focused on materials and training and not erasing LGBT plus people from existence. Because I can tell the minister and tell the house quite clearly, as I'm sure many others will, that no matter how hard some people might try, we are not going back in the closet. We exist, and there's nothing extreme about knowing we exist. And in the RSC review, the government should be committing to examining why teachers lack the confidence in teaching it, investing materi in materials to support the teaching on the subject, and not try to erase LGBT plus people from existence 
in the eyes of the students that teachers are there to look after. I uh, remind members to, um, to Bob if they do wish to be called in the debate. And can I also ask members to address the chair, if you would, please? Thank you. Um, the question is that this House has considered e-petitions 630932 and 631529 relating to LGBT content in relationships education. Sarah Champion. Thank you, Mr Dowd. It is always a pleasure to serve under your guidance. And can I also thank the Honourable Member for Cars Holton and Wallington for, A, his very reasoned uh, speech, but also for bringing forward his own experiences, which I think is a very powerful way to open this debate. Um, when I was first elected, I was quite um, focused on trying to prevent child abuse and put child protection in place. And I set up a campaign called Dare to Care with about 40 organisations, charities and survivors of abuse. And we looked at how could we keep children safe. And the one thing that all of us felt was the most powerful was relationship education from primary school age. And I was incredibly proud, and I think it will probably be my biggest achievement, that in June 2017 we got cross-party support for relationship education to be mandatory from primary school, uh, sex and relationship from secondary school. And I know that that is already empowering children. And what we're talking about when we're talking about RSE, particularly when we're talking about primary school, is teaching children to, protect, uh, to respect themselves and respect others. And that's what we're talking about here today, I believe. Because relationship education is about equipping all children to be safe, to recognize abuse and exploitation, to know how to report it and to seek help. LGBTQ plus people, children particularly, must be recognized and included in the same way as heterosexual relationship education. Quite simply, because LGBTQ people exist. They will experience relationships, sex, emotional connections, good and bad, in the same way as everyone else and they have the right to be educated on the joys and the dangers that come alongside those things. Avoiding mentioning the very existence of LGBTQ in front of pupils and denying them the access to relationship education their peers will get does nothing to safeguard them. And it also does nothing to protect them from the hatred which it appalls me seems to be getting worse and worse in this country. I want a UK, I want a world that is tolerant, that is respectful, and that appreciates and celebrates difference. And to exclude that leads us to a very dark place. And we know that in our recent history, because it has distressing echoes of Section 28. Section 28 was repealed in 2003, and it was done so because parliamentarians understood the great harms caused by the legislation and the chilling effect and discriminatory culture that rippled out from it. Those lessons from Section 28 have informed successive government's policies ever since, and it informs the cross-party support of LGBTQ plus inclusivity in RHSE guidance. It informed a generation of teachers who want to do better by their pupils, and a generation of parents who want their children to access LGBTQ plus education. Those who seek to exclude LGBT content will argue that it's not appropriate or necessary to teach it to primary age children. But I wonder what they actually think is being taught. Why is it so scary to them? Why do they not trust the teachers in this respect? In key stage one, being LGBTQ plus inclusive is as simple as acknowledging different families parents, carers, and other family members who may be lesbian, gay, or trans. Those people and families exist, and children in our school communities need to know that any family that provides love, security, and care is a valid family. If the children already know that they're gay, as many adult LGBTQ plus people say they did right back in the early days of primary, they need to know that all the safeguarding messages in school are for them too. No child should be excluded. 
made invisible or made to feel that they are other or not deserving of support from a trusted adult because only this opens a door for exploitation and the abuse of them. By key stage two, when children are going through and studying and, and going through puberty and studying puberty, they will have their own questions about the relationship between their bodies and sex. Opponents of inclusive LGBT plus yep, education claim that it sexualizes children, but this is reflected in a very narrow view of LGBTQ plus people. You cannot read through a briefing from the anti-lobby without hearing about particular sex acts, as if being LGBT plus and being highly sexualized are synonymous, the total of someone's identity. It also reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of inclusive relationship education. The lessons that I have campaigned for have always been about helping children to understand the core values that underpin healthy relationships, mutual respect, self-respect, kindness and trust. It's also about knowing how, where and when to seek help with safeguarding and with their mental and physical help. These lessons are not pushing some evil agenda to corrupt young minds. They are preparing all children for the world as it is, where LGBTQ plus people exist and relationships happen, and also where the, the world where it is dark and there are some pretty awful haters out there. It would be a travesty in this place if we were to unlearn all that we saw during the horror of Section 28 and go back to a place of suspicion and hatred, which leaves our LGBTQ plus young children feeling alone and fearful once again. We must ensure the current generation of young people leaving school, all young children leaving school, have the tools, the skills, and the support that they need to be safe, to be happy, to be respectful, not to tolerate hate, not to tolerate extremism, and engage in healthy relationships that enable them to thrive in our society. Thank you. Um, under your chairmanship. Impassioned calls for the government to remove LGBT content from primary school curriculum, and there are equally impassioned calls that children of 11 and under should be taught about LGBT relationships the two petitions we're debating here today, but they do reflect real anxiety over this hugely sensitive issue. The feelings run very high, understandably so. Some worry about exposing young children to age-inappropriate material and foisting adult preoccupations on them, whilst others feel strongly that some children will not be able to make informed decisions about health, well-being and relationships without developing an understanding of LGBT issues at a fairly young age. I will make a few brief points on the issue which chiefly relate to the teaching of transgender ideology. These, uh, these points are informed by a very unhappy experience in my constituency where an academy trust developed a syllabus designed for primary school children promoting transgender ideology. The ideas at the heart of this, the teaching materials that were proposed, and the manner in which the matter was handled caused massive upset among the parent body and a catastrophic breakdown in trust. And indeed, we all have loads of WhatsApp groups we're on. The busiest WhatsApp group I have is the group uh, in my constituency which the parents have entitled Protect Our Children. Thankfully, there has now been a resolution of thoughts to this with parents rightly being put back in control of what their primary age children are taught. But this episode has impressed on me the need to remember that our understanding of transgender theory is by no means settled, and there is not a consensus of opinion. My of course. On the point about primary school aged children, as a mother myself of a, a primary aged school child... Oh, sorry, yes, sorry. Yes, I did it, go on. As a mother of a child of primary school age myself, I do not want him or other children to learn about sex full stop, whether that's straight or gay. I also do not want to see young children at primary school to be taught about changing gender. Whatever people want to do when they're older, no problem. You know, life's short, be happy. But does my honourable friend agree that we need to be protecting the innocence of children and their childhood, especially at primary school age? Well, I'm 
respect, thank you. Um, and indeed respecting parents, because, of course, the long-term emotional consequences of transition are not properly understood. We should be careful about teaching contested concepts to young and impressionable children. We would not, do, be, we would, we would not be doing right by the majority of parents if we fail to acknowledge that the idea that sex is a sign of birth is not a universally held view. But the complexities of explaining this to children of 11 and under are pretty obvious. I also struggle to see how this issue could be taught honestly and objectively without explaining that there may be other reasons why a person feels uncomfortable about themselves or their body. But teaching primary age children is clearly hugely problematic. Instinctively, for these reasons, I feel that the complex issue of transgender ideology has no real place on the primary school curriculum. But it's perhaps unrealistic to think that issues relating to gender will not crop up. Of course they will. Some children will question their gender, and many will meet transgender adults. So where primary schools feel such education does need to be included, and that will not be everywhere, we need to support teachers in navigating the sensitivities and to ensure that schools are safe places for everybody. The government needs to urgently, therefore, issue clear and prescriptive guidance on content and, as anticipated, I think, by the current review, to have a firm grip on the materials that schools used. I would prefer that what, what is taught should reflect the fact that there is a divergence of view on the issue of transgender but really at primary school level, what is taught about this need not go much further than emphasising that the choices people make should never be the subject of unkindness. The emphasis on parental engagement with the curriculum is welcome. Communication and trust between parents and schools is very important here. But whilst it's sensible to let parents see what their children will be taught before lessons are delivered, and whilst a parental opt-out may be useful, Children, of course, bound to discuss these topics amongst themselves. So the focus, I think, must be on teachers getting it right and ensure that the message primary age children receive is not confusing, age-inappropriate or sexualised. I rise to support the second uh, petition particularly, but I think that... Uh, it is important that we recognise, of course, that there are concerns that I hope that can always be uh, allayed by people who have signed that first petition. But let us remember um, what we're really talking about. We are talking about age-appropriate education for children. And it is not the first time that people have deliberately used age-appropriate education to try and ban wider education. That is, in fact, one of the ways Section 28 itself was introduced. People will remember Jenny lives with Eric and Martin, a rather dull and boring book about a little girl who goes and have ice cream with her two daddies, goes and walks through a park with her two daddies, um, uh, and was the book that caused or one of the books that caused the furore when it was stopped by London County Council or the Greater London Authority or whatever it was called at the time um, and uh, suggested to be in uh, schools. Now, if you look at that book, I don't think anyone in here would suggest anything other than it being appropriate for probably children who are three to five, which is what it was designated at the time. It's rather dull and boring, as these things should be in many respects, because people's boring and dull lives need to be explained to children in all their different aspects um, and orientations. And, of course, we see that. If you look through children's libraries at the moment in schools, you have the fantastic Anna Tango Makes Three, where you have um, two father penguins raising a penguin child, a, a true story, actually, based in a zoo, you have what does a princess really look like? That's for zero to three years old, about how um, anyone can be a princess if they want, and uh, um, uh, everyone is flawed. And the book ends, of course, by the father and the child realising that actually we are all flawed, but we are all striving to be good people. Or, you know, love makes a family, 
where you see pictures of loving families in all their diversity, mixed race families where the grandparents are raising the children, etc. Um, or Twas the Night Before Pride, four to eight-year-old appropriate. Learning where you learn about all the different um, uh, backgrounds of why people go on Pride and why people celebrate. Or, of course, um, other books, of which are for older age groups. Would I give Twas the Night Before Pride to a two-year-old? No, because quite clearly on the book, on the cover, it says that it is appropriate for four to eight year olds. And the same is true with teaching materials. I mean, these books are in, uh, in, in libraries of schools, but the same is true of teaching materials. You do different materials and different levels of education for all different ages. But I'm afraid there is not a starting point where we need to start to realise that there are lots of different families. There's not a starting point also to realise that gender and sex are important dividing points around society. Now, I think that children in lower primary school, infant school, generally shouldn't be divided very much about sex at all. They should be taught, actually, you can be anything you want, you can play with any of the toys you want, you can do all of the sports activities that you want at that age. I don't think we should have almost any gendered specific activities or separation at that age. And I think it's a great shame that we now see adverts for Lego that are gendered, whereas only... 30 years ago, Lego adverts would have no gender attached to them. I think that we've gone backwards in many respects for our infant and uh, uh, lower primary school ages. But that doesn't mean that we should be blind to it. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't say, when you get older, sometimes girls and boys do separate off and do different activities. But that, but that should be dealt with in an age-appropriate way. It shouldn't mean that, of course, sometimes when we talk about bits of the body as well. You know, children of a very young age will be curious about that. It should be described in an age-appropriate manner. To ignore differences in that sense actually is to raise our children oblivious to what is appropriate, what parts of their body are appropriate to show or to touch, what parts of their body are appropriate to touch of others. And if we don't get that across, what we actually do is create children who are less safe. Because when people then do inappropriately do and have inappropriate relationships with those children, they are not taught that that is wrong or right. And if we just talk about it in the sense of mummy and daddy, then actually we also set up a relationship danger where we are not explaining children that as you get older, your older brother and sister, your older aunts and uncles, might also have different forms of relationship that are healthy and that are safe. And so I do think it's important that it is done. Where I think we have gone wrong, particularly in this, is that we have had a lack of proper guidelines when this was rolled out initially. And if we remember some of the Birmingham, when some of the Birmingham protests were happening, we were expecting teachers to engage with the community without proper, clear guidelines from the Department of Education about what was and what wasn't appropriate. So teachers were having to go and bat for very sensible policies very often without having the defence of, well, we are following the national guidelines. Now, those guidelines have now been out for a little while, and it's perfectly sensible for those guidelines from time to time to be reviewed to make sure that they are still working. And I do think that we should be saying, in all aspects of education, parents should be encouraged to see the text of the work. I think in maths and in English, we should not be having secret education where we say to our parents, oh, well, if you want to know what um, literature your children are studying, no, I'm afraid you can't do that. We should be open about it. Here's the book that we're studying. Here's the resources. Partly because... We want to encourage parents to go on a learning journey with their children. We know children perform best in schools when the parents are working at the same pace with the children. Now, that sometimes means the parents are learning as well. I remember, you know, when I have taught nieces and nephews or worked with, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, other younger children and they're doing maths and I've tried to help them do that, sometimes I am learning 
uh, much about how they do long arithmetic nowadays very differently to how I did it. So I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, as a minimum, we expect parents to see the resources. But I don't think that is unusual. We should not be targeting LGBT-specific RSHE in that discussion. We should be talking about it as a wider school community. And actually, I think there is a case also for schools that say we want parents to come in to learn about uh, the RSE, RSHE education that we're doing. I actually think we should be encouraging schools to offer those activities for also wider parts of the curriculum as well. Because we often know that children from highly educated backgrounds have a advantage because the parents are easily able to engage in the curriculum and parents who don't have that same academic background might not be able to. So schools inviting people in to, um, to engage with that is something that we should be encouraging. I will do. Um, Mark makes some very important points. Would you agree that there's also additional um, safeguards can be put in place? For example, um, in, in Wales, the curriculum very specifically says that it has to be developmentally appropriate for young people. So it's not just the age, it's also knowledge and maturity, additional learning needs and physiological and emotional development that are taken into account to ensure the materials are provided at the right stage for that young person. I, I, I totally agree they're for the right person. Where I think that we also need to be clear is it shouldn't only be if there is a trans child in the school. These things are for wider importance. I remember, not on, our, um, not on se uh, uh, relationship education, but on um, education around different religions at primary school. I went to a school um, where, in my year group, and um, we were almost exclusively white. Um, and Christian background. But we learnt about Buddhism at primary school, we learnt about Hinduism, the different festivals. I think there is a danger if we just say, oh, well, we should only teach these things if there happens to be a gay uh, family in the classroom or if there happens to be um, an older sibling that is transgender. Because I have... Um, you know, benefited hugely. Those trips that we did as a school to the synagogue, even though I think I'm right, but you know, you never know, saying that there wasn't a, um, a, a Jewish uh, child in the school, were really important for me to understand the different backgrounds that different families have. So when I went to secondary school, and we did mix with a bigger group of people who were from different groups um, uh, and, and different backgrounds, we understood where they were coming uh, from. Um, I, I also want to touch briefly on, um, on the point that I made as an intervention earlier on, um, which is that I do think that we have got uh, waylaid in some of this uh, debate and conversation about condemning organisations that produce different age-specific materials. It is quite right that organisations, sex uh, um, and relationship-based organisations that specialise in this, will produce materials that are for adults, and will produce materials that are for children. And on their website, they will publish all those materials. It is totally right that they will do that. It is, of course, totally wrong for a teacher to pick an adult material and do it with, um, and do those activities with, um, with younger people. When we had this debate last time, I remember a number of members on, um, uh, uh, on the opposing side of the argument uh, reading out a number of rather adult activities. But when we got to the bottom of it, there was no evidence that those activities had been run in any primary school in this country. And still today, there is no evidence that I have seen that they have been run. Now, I'm sure uh, the exception will prove the rule in the sense that the outrage of one example out of our 100,000 uh, schools that we have across our country will be an example where it needs to be, um, it needs to be age specific. But that is why we need a better system for the Department for Education to say, here are the books that we recommend. Here are the educational resources that we recommend. Here are the organisations. Diversity Role Models is one organisation that does great. They've released a set of great cartoons recently that touch on all these different issues, uh, launched only a few weeks ago at the Disney headquarters here in London. That is the kind of thing that the department should be signposting to so teachers can get the reassurance, so that parents can get the reassurance, but most importantly, so that children can learn about the glorious diversity of the world that they are growing up in, and so that when they get to the right age, they are equipped and prepared to keep themselves safe and to have a happy and wonderful life. Thank you.
Peter Gibson. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a under your chairmanship, and can I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Cushalton and Wallington, for leading this debate on behalf of the Petitions Committee in his usual exemplary manner. Both petitions that have prompted this debate today were clearly very popular. On one hand, those who want to see LGBT content on school curriculums, and on the other, those who do not. Indeed, in Darlington, one petition was signed by 211 people, and the other was signed by 293 people. Mr Dowd, as a gay teenager growing up, I know how alone I felt, like I was the only one, scared of people knowing, and what exactly that would mean for me if they did. LGBT issues were not discussed at school, and sex education, such as it was, was largely confined to some lessons in the biology lab. Thankfully, things have improved, and whilst not perfect and still somewhat controversial, sex relationships and LGBT issues are taught in the context of a range of issues. These issues should be taught at an age that is appropriate and indeed the material used should be appropriate too, and subject to inspection and approval of parents. Mr Dowd, I do welcome this debate, which in my view is timely, coming so soon after the debate on the private <coughs> member's bill from the Honourable Member for Brighton Kempdown, and indeed the debate which we sadly didn't have on Friday on the Right Honourable Member for South West Norfolk's bill. Mr Dowd, I have spoken openly many times about my support for lesbian and gay people and those with gender dysphoria. And this debate is an important opportunity to set out, in the context of what is appropriate for children to know, my views on these issues. I passionately believe that our children should not be subjected to conversion practices, just as I do not believe that our children should be medicalised. However, and particularly whilst we are discussing what is appropriate to tell young people, those who are experiencing gender dysphoria should be able to access appropriate counselling, challenging conversations and support free from legislation preventing them from having such care. And Mr Dowd, whilst I'm putting these matters on the record, on a topic which to my mind should not be a political football, I believe that it is possible to stand up for the protection of safe spaces for women so that they are safe and comfortable at the same time as having respect for those with gender dysphoria. And I also believe that women should be entitled to compete in sports with other women. So for the record, Mr Chairman, I respect trans people and want them to be free from discrimination. But I respect women too and they are entitled to have their spaces in which they are safe and comfortable. Mr Dowd, the language of respect, tolerance and understanding is so important for our young people to hear. If we do not teach our young people that people in society are LGBT, how will they have the understanding and knowledge to navigate these issues for themselves in society? Surely we want our young people to be tolerant understanding and have respect for everyone, core British values, and we are unlikely to achieve that by keeping them in the dark. Our children live in our communities where families come in all forms of shapes and sizes, but the one thing alone that ensures young people have the best upbringing is where they grow up with love. People in our communities, and indeed in our children's families, are LGBT, and it is to my mind right that they learn about the society in which they will grow up and live in an age-appropriate way. And I think the point from the Honourable Gentleman from Cardiff South about that being developmentally appropriate is entirely right too. Mr Dowd, it is a fact that young people do have sex and young people do experiment. We should not ignore this but instead address it head on. We must ensure that schools have the resources needed to educate young people about how to have sex safely. Then we are more likely to be able to deal with the worrying rise in STDs that we have seen. If we had taken this approach through the 1990s, 
we might not have seen the extent of issues that we did with HIV. So whilst I commend the government for all that it's doing to bring about zero transmissions on HIV by 2030, improving and extending safer sex education is a key part to fulfilling that objective. Mr. Dowd, we have sadly seen increases in hate crimes and discrimination towards LGBT people. Hate and discrimination come from ignorance and intolerance. If we tackle those issues with education and understanding, we set the groundwork for reductions in these problems in the future. I'll be happy to give away. Again, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is making a characteristically powerful um, speech, and of course it's not just hate crime in society matters, but he agrees with me, it's also of course what is happening in schools for young LGBT plus people. And there was a study by Just Like Us in, I think, 2001 that said that 91% of LGBT young people would have heard negative language about being LGBT plus, and that they were twice as likely to have been bullied, and inclusive education is a critical way of tackling that. I, I thank my honourable friend for his intervention, and I couldn't agree more with him. Tackling homophobia, transphobia, bullying in our schools is absolutely key and educating people about those in society that they will meet is absolutely key to that. Mr Dowd, teaching our kids that LGBT people exist does not and will not make them so, but it may help those young people who are questioning who they are and are going to be from feeling so isolated and excluded. It will also, to my mind, increase the understanding, tolerance and acceptance of those around them. I've spent a great deal of my time in schools in my constituency and some schools in Darlington are doing some fantastic work in this area and I commend them for it. And I particularly want to highlight the work of Wyvern Academy with its alliance group providing mutual support under the guidance of teaching staff. In conclusion, Mr Dowd, I believe that it is right that we teach our children about the world that they will become citizens of, as is appropriate to their age, free from conversion practices, free from medicalisation, underpinned by appropriate and robust counselling where appropriate. We will help improve tolerance, understanding and acceptance. We will help to reduce hate and discrimination. We will help to reduce sexually transmitted diseases and we will underpin British values of individual liberty, mutual respect and tolerance of others. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Dyer. I left school just over 10 years after homosexuality was decriminalised and there was certainly nothing like <laughs> um, LGBT uh, affirming or inclusive SRE uh, and as a consequence... I don't know anyone at school who uh, was openly gay. I certainly didn't come out as gay till after I left school and found the relatively, relatively safe space of Sussex University and was fortunate enough to have a very supportive uh, family and uh, group of friends. I was very moved, therefore, when I met one of my sc uh, schools in Exeter a few weeks ago, invited by a group of uh, LGBTQ plus students for their weekly safe space hour where they got together and talked about their lives and their feelings and so forth. Um, it was an extremely moving experience for me because I thought of all the people of my generation who'd been through experiences at school who would have benefited from living in a more, in a more enlightened age. And of course, Section 28, to which a number of colleagues have referred, was very much a backlash against the increasing visibility of lesbian and gay people after decriminalisation at the end of the 60s. And I think that what's happening now with the backlashes we're seeing now against uh, LGBT inclusive and affirming education in schools is something rather similar in that uh, that visibility has continued, particularly when it comes to trans and non-binary uh, young, uh, young people. And I, I just hope that we will resist it because some of the same arguments that I'm hearing now are very similar to the ones that I heard back then, that you, sort of, that you can make somebody gay or lesbian. And now people are saying you can make somebody trans. It's an ideology. And that, 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 that phrase has been uh, banded around in this debate a number of times already. And it puzzles me and upsets me because being trans is not an ideology. It's who you are. It's something innate. Gender dysphoria is a, is a condition that's been recognised for decades, if not hundreds of years, in human 
uh, societies. So I worry that we're going back to pathologize and demonize uh, people who simply want to be themselves. And young people in particular deserve the right to be uh, respected and supported. And while I'm delighted to say that these days the vast majority of families are supportive and affirming of uh, their children and other uh, young LGBT people uh, in general, I'm afraid that we know that sadly still some aren't. Um, I do some work with an LGBTQI charity that works with young, young homeless people. 30% of young homeless people in this country are LGBT, LGBTQ+, plus, who have been rejected by their families, having been open about their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Those young people need a safe space in school, and what schools have so brilliantly provided in recent years is that safe space. Although I have to say, whenever I pick up um, feedback or criticism, particularly from young people themselves about SRE education in schools, this is that it's not affirming and, and inclusive, or certainly not of good enough quality enough, or it's lacking altogether. So the criticism I'm hearing from young people is that we, we need to build on what we've achieved, treat everybody with respect, and it saddens me, as I prepare to leave this house after 27 years, that having come in um, at a time of moral panic about gay people and having uh, been part of, myself, some of the fantastic progress that's been made in this country in terms of being a more tolerant and accepting and humane uh, place, that that consensus in recent years has broken down somewhat. And I hope that uh, the election that will come this year will help draw land in the sand on, a line in the sand on that and we can move on to a more hopeful and optimistic future where, where not only all our young people but everybody in this country, uh, whatever their sexual orientation or gender identity, is supported and treated with respect. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, my colleague on the Petitions Committee from Carl Shorten and Warrington for his, uh, his, opening, his opening remarks. Uh, currently, up and down the country, we have schools teaching our children that girls can be boys and boys can be girls. It's hard to believe, and this is the issue that I am specifically focusing on today. Let me start with an analogy. If we told our children 2 plus 2 equals 5 enough times throughout their education, would we be surprised if some, not all, but some, started to believe it? I believe um, We do trust teachers to teach that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So if we trust them in that respect, why do we not trust their judgment in all respect? I thank the Honourable Member for uh, her contribution, and I think... I will come back to my speech. Um, don't just spoil the flow of it, is it? Uh, but, no, no, it's fine. But I think from what I've heard, I think there's a consensus here that what we should be teaching children should be transparent, pay, teachers should be able to see it. It should be age appropriate. But I believe it should also be grounded in truth. And the fact of the matter is, is that we're not... We, there's been some um, remarks from lots of people here saying that this uh, literature that we're showing our children is not there and there's no real evidence of it. And I think members are literally burying their head in the sands with this. And if they didn't, and if they actually worked with myself and maybe the Department for Education and actually looked at all the evidence that I've got then maybe we wouldn't have to go onto social media and say, look what our kids have been taught, this is abhorrent, and then for somebody to jump on my page, and this and so on and so forth. If the actual, all the adults in the room actually sat down with the minister and said, look, this is what's happening. I have examples in my folder, but we can't show pictures in these, in so these I'll debates. Give away. Yeah, of I course. Mean, I'll, give away. I'll give you an example. Um, one school in my constituency was uh, using a book that included a picture of a grandfather in a gimp suit. To primary school. I don't know member for giving way. There's so much evidence out there of bad actors in this field, and I will come on to them, but I, I, I do thank her for... 
Wouldn't be surprised that some, not all, but some would start to believe it, especially when told by probably one of the main influences in their life, their teacher. Put this together with many on social media also saying that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Then, let's say, people started wearing lanyards saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. Maybe not really believing it, just thinking that it's kind to do so. To help make people who believe 2 plus 2 equals 5 feel included. Then, let's say, the same people started putting 2 plus 2 for, equals 5 on their email footers for, re, uh, for similar reasons. This thought gets compounded further when maybe an irresponsible broadcaster through one of their main soaps has a storyline where an adult tells a 12-year-old it's okay to think 2 plus 2 equals 5. Then let's say private businesses started putting posters up saying, again, 2 plus 2 equals 5. Flags down high street saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. And then let's say some people start to stand up and say, no, it doesn't. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Let's tell the truth. Let's say those individuals are called bigots and are silenced by feminist individuals on social media. Let's say if this scenario took place, would we be surprised that we would have thousands of young children believing 2 plus 2 equals 5? And this is exactly where we have got to teaching gender identity in our schools. Should our children be exposed to material that states they can be a boy or a girl depending on how they feel? No, they shouldn't. I agree 100% with the petitioners who want to remove this from our schools. Children should not be subject under any circumstances to unscientific ideological material that leads to harm. I believe there is nothing more abhorrent than misleading the young and that this must stop. I would gladly agree, yeah. I thank you for just for clarification. He said he agreed with the petitioners, but the petition does state specifically removal of LGBT plus content. Is it just the T that he wants to remove, or does he want to remove all LGBT content as well? No, no, it's the T that I'm discussing today, but I believe the sexualisation of our children should stop within schools. All of it. All of it. I just don't think there's any need for it, especially in primary schools. I genuinely do believe there is absolutely no need for it. I will give way. I'm very interested in, in his analogy, um, but I'm a bit unclear. Is he saying that we shouldn't teach what 2 plus 2 equals at all, i.e. we shouldn't teach anything around relationships, so we shouldn't teach about straight relationships either. We shouldn't teach that parents, there are mothers and fathers and all that kind of thing. Or is he just saying that he wants, um, he wants it to be taught but he only wants one outcome, which is that you have to be straight. Because that's what's not clear. Because in every book, whether it be Enid Blyton or Harry Potter or whatever, there are relationships that are talked about in those literature books, and we teach children literature. In how the school works when you, in primary schools, you have a hen, and it lays an egg, and the egg hatches. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so, so it would be great to know what he wants, only straight or just nothing. I thank the Honourable Member for his speech. Um, the, I said right at the beginning I was spe speaking specifically on the trans. And what I was trying to say is that I believe there's an untruth there. 2 plus 2 equals 4. And we seem to be teaching 2 plus 2 equals 5 when it comes to gender. That's what I'm trying to say. I believe boys are boys and girls are girls and they cannot change sex. Stonewall mermaids and other bad actors in this field have lobbied schools into subscribing, to the, into subscribing to their ideologies which are not grounded in anything factual. We have mainstream publishers such as HarperCollins uh, publishing school textbooks telling children, and I quote, myth one, the world is divided into men and women. HarperCollins actually teaches children trans women are women and trans men are men. If that were so, that would be the end of female-only sports. We have Stonewall teaching children everyone has a gender identity. I don't, so it can't be true. We are lying to children. We have Brooke teaching that a man who identifies as a woman is a woman of trans history, or even simply just a woman. If that were so, that would be the end of female-only spaces. We have some teachers who have written to me who are too scared not to teach these lessons 
when they know what they are teaching is wrong. And this cannot and should not continue. The education department have quite rightly written letters to school telling them to, to let all parents see what their children are being taught. Yet we have evidence that some schools are ignoring this and continuing regardless. Parents who have been shown what is being taught have sometimes only seen part of the material or have had to go into schools to see it and are told they can't photograph or copy it. Copyright issues have trumped our children's safety. And be under no illusion, this is happening across the country. Swindon Council produced its own material for use across local schools that is quite clearly abhorrent. A staff member from Poppanolly, who explains to primary school children that he is trans and non-binary, claims to have spoken to 100,000 children. Jigsaw says it has worked in 7,000 schools. In 1994, we had 12 children suffering with confusion about their body and attending gender clinics. Now we have 5,000 on a waiting list, and we ask why. I tell you why, because our schools have been captured by bad actors in despicable business, making huge sums of money out of feeding our children this ideology. We should not have to put legislation in place to deal with this. We as a nation should be playing no part in this. But if individuals are too weak or too scared to stand up and say no to this ideology, then I'm afraid we must legislate. We must put legislation in place to deal with this with immediate effect. In 10 to 20 years' time, this will be the next contaminated blood scandal or post office scandal. I hope all who have been pushing this will be dealt with accordingly. I will give, I must give way. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Um, I, I wonder if he could clarify something for me. And his views on this particular subject are well documented and well circulated. I wonder if he could clarify for me and for everybody else here. Does he believe that the diagnosis of gender dysphoria in somebody that is identifying as trans it simply doesn't exist? I thank my honourable friend for his um, intervention. And I'd just like to say about the member for Darlington, him and I obviously complete opposite sides of this argument. Um, and I know he doesn't agree with I know he doesn't agree with me. But I do believe that we've both been able to speak on this with each other with respect. And I hope that continues. I really do hope that continues. Um, I believe there's people out there that are struggling with gender dysphoria. I genuinely do believe oh, it. Sorry, uh, sorry, 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 Chair. I genuinely do believe there's people out there who are struggling with their gender dysphoria. And I think we should treat all these people, and I do come on to that in my speech, I think we should treat these people with respect and with kindness. And as long as we don't have biological males in single-sex spaces, and as long as we don't have biological males in women's sport, and as long as we're not indoctrinating our children with this, I haven't got an issue. I have not got an issue. And I genuinely believe there's people out there who are confused with this. And they should be able to go to people and speak and need help and this and that. I don't think we should be going to people for it to be affirmed. I think they should be able to have an open conversation and a free conversation about this. But I think there's a time and a place for it. And our schools is not the time or the place. I have recently written to the Education Department along with several colleagues to request that parents can withdraw their child from RSHE lessons. At present, children can only be withdrawn from sex education. However, we have an industry that seems set on teaching our children they can be the opposite sex to what they were born. They have published this material in relationships part of their textbooks, and therefore children cannot be removed from these lessons. Parents must be able to protect their children from this ideology. They must be able to do it now. Now, before more children are affected by this teaching. We have at present absenteeism levels not seen before within our schools. And this material is not helping. 
I asked the minister, why are we allowing this in our schools? A false idea with no basis in science that is leading some vulnerable children to seek puberty blockers, then cross-sex hormones, then evasive risky surgery. <coughs> These practices impact bone and brain development. They chemically castrate children. They leave vulnerable children, vulnerable young people, living with lifelong irreversible complications. I can see why parents would choose not to send their child to a school that's teaching this. I wouldn't. So what is the answer? Well, I believe this teaching has to stop in our schools. We need to take this literature out of our schools completely, change the RSHE guidance, and allow parents to withdraw their children from RSHE as a safety net. And as a society, we should call out every organisation that's taking part in this. Individuals who are joining in with this rhetoric should stop and think where does this end? Stop and think with regards to trans-progressive flags in the lanyards and the pronoun email footers. Because where does it end for our young children when they see this? Stop and think about fueling confusion in society and especially within the minds of our children. And if we encounter any person who is personally struggling with this, we just need to be kind. We shouldn't have to legislate for kindness. We should all just be decent and treat people with respect. But sometimes we also have to be cruel to be kind. Sometimes we must have to say no. Parents, teachers, every adult just needs to be strong and say no to children. No, they are not born in the wrong body. Let me say this one more time. There are few things more dishonourable than misleading the young. And I, for one, will play no part in it. I hope the department will really step up now. The Department of Health is beginning to see the light. The Home Office is too. I hope the Education Department can. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Mr Dowd. Um, I really want to thank the Honourable Member for Cushalton and Wallington for bringing this debate forward on behalf of the Petitions Committee. As the, a former chair of the Petitions Committee, I appreciate how important it is for people to have their say on issues that they care most about, and I'm glad we're having this discussion today. And it's also good to be in this debate with so many of my former petition committee members. And I pay tribute to colleagues, uh, honourable members for Rotherham, Brighton, Kemptown and Exeter who have spoken um, about their views on this issue. As honourable members have set out, it has been a legal requirement for all primary schools in England to teach relationships education and for all secondary schools to teach relationships and sex education since September 2020, though schools were able to delay this for a year due to the pandemic. Within the legislation, primary schools can choose to teach age-appropriate sex education in addition to relationship education. Many primary schools choose to teach sex education tailored to the age, physical and emotional maturity of their pupils but the primary focus is on ensuring children have the building blocks for positive and safe relationships, starting with family and friends, how to treat one another with kindness, and recognising the difference between online and offline friendships. The legislation provides for the right of parents to withdraw their children from sex education, whilst providing children approaching 16 with rights to opt in, and gives schools, including faith schools, flexibility in their approach. Schools are required to consult with parents <coughs> when developing and reviewing their policies on relationships, education and RSE. However, when and how that content is taught is a decision for schools. Importantly, the regulations also provide that a school's policy must be published online and must be available to an individual free of charge so that parents can be confident about what is being taught. This is also important so that parents can be available to their child at home to talk about what might be being taught in school 
and be prepared for any questions or discussion points that might arise from their child. Labour has put great focus on the relationship between schools and families, and open and transparent communication on these issues forms an important part of that. And of course, these positive relationships within our education system begin with how a government approaches these things too. We've too often seen a combative approach with schools, and it can filter down to a combative approach between schools and families. Labour wants to see a much more positive and constructive approach to the education of our children and young people. Turning specifically to the section on LGBT-specific content, the guidance states that at the point at which schools consider it appropriate to teach their pupils about LGBT, they should ensure that this content is fully integrated into their programme of study for this area of the curriculum, rather than delivered as a standalone unit or lesson. Labour agrees that it's important that LGBT issues are taught as part of relationships and sex education, and it's done in a way that is inclusive and respectful to all. The Department for Education announced a review of the statutory guidance last year in the context of a whole variety of developing concerns, including a worrying increase in sexual harassment, violence against women and girls, developments in activities online, and a worrying deterioration in the mental health of young people. A consultation on guidance for schools and colleges on supporting questioning, gender questioning children also closed last week, with the government response due later this year. There are strong and sometimes conflicting views on these issues, as we've heard in the debate today. Teachers and school leaders have therefore been very clear on their need for guidance from government on the approach to take in relation to this when teaching young people about relationships and sex. Teachers are not clinicians, mental health professionals or campaigners. They are educators and as such are required to educate within a clear framework that complies with equalities legislation and ensures that all teachers feel confident and well informed about the content they are to teach. And it's therefore right that this issue went out to consultation and I know that organisations and people with a range of opinions will have fed back to the government. And I look forward to seeing how this diversity of opinion will be reflected in the final guidance which is brought forward. And I hope to hear more detail from the Minister on the timetable for the publication of consultation responses and the final guidance. Labour is the party of equality. The last Labour government did more to advance LGBT equality than any other in British history whether making it illegal to discriminate on the grounds of sexual orientation, allowing lesbian and gay couples to adopt, or making homophobia and transphobia hate crimes. And it is in that spirit that we must redouble our efforts to ensure that these conversations are held with the utmost respect and compassion and careful consideration for those potentially affected by our deliberations and decisions. These issues should not be used as a political football in our politics, as we have unfortunately seen too much of in recent years. Within schools, Labour is keen to ensure that the school curriculum ensures every child feels represented and receives a high quality and enriching education. Our expert-led curriculum and assessment review will look at how we will deliver a broad and balanced curriculum which reflects the whole of our society and we will learn from international best practice and expert research in doing so. This is all part of Labour's mission to break down the barriers to opportunity for everyone. And once again, I thank the member for Cashalton and Wallington for bringing forward this debate, for the constructive way in which he set out his arguments. And I look forward to hearing next steps on these issues from the Minister. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr Dowd, it's a great pleasure to see you in the chair, I think, in my case for the first time today. Um, and it's been a pleasure to be able to be here for this well-attended debate in Westminster Hall. I want to thank my honourable friend for Carl Sholton and Wallington for opening the petition debate um, uh, on whether lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender content should be included in relationships education in, in primary schools. And I'd also like to thank the petitioners involved in the two petitions. These are, as my honourable friend for Gravesham said, these are sensitive subjects from from different perspectives and today we've had a passionate but respectful and reflective uh, debate 
informed, I have to say, I think very well by colleagues, constituency experiences, and in multiple cases by their own uh, personal experiences, which, which they've shared uh, today. Um, and I want to uh, thank everyone who's taken part, my honourable friend from Coshalton and uh, Wallington, my honourable friend from Gravesham, my honourable friend from Darlington, my honourable friend from Do uh, Don Valley, the honourable member for Rotherham uh, and from Brighton, Kempton, the right honourable member for uh, Exeter, and of course, uh, the lady who speaks for the opposition, the um, honourable lady from Newcastle upon Tyne North, and also those others uh, who have taken part through, um, uh, through, through interventions. Mr Dowd, when we brought in the Relationship, Sex and Health Education Statutory Guidance from September 2020, it was the first update in that guidance for 19 years. And in the intervening period, a lot had changed. A lot had changed in our, in our society. The law uh, had changed in important ways. Um, and technology and new media have, had changed and continue to change uh, both what happens in our society but also what our children are exposed to in ways uh, that, as I say, continue to develop to this day. I believe it is essential to support all pupils to have the, the knowledge that they need to lead happy, safe and healthy lives and that they're able to understand and respect difference in others. It isn't just my view, it also comes from extensive engagement with teachers, with parents and, and others when we issued the call for evidence uh, and the consultation on RSHE back in 2018. It's also been repeated today by multiple colleagues across the House, including, I thought rather powerfully, from my, my honourable friend from, from Darlington. High quality, evidence-based and age-appropriate uh, a teaching of RSHE can help to achieve exactly what I have just set out. It can prepare pupils for the opportunities and the responsibilities of adult life and can promote pupils' spiritual, moral, social, cultural, mental and physical development. And in that context, we want all children to understand the importance of respect for relationships and the different types of loving and healthy relationships that exist in our society. In primary schools, age-appropriate relationships education involves supporting children to learn about what healthy relationships are, about mutual respect, trustworthiness, loyalty, kindness and generosity, as well as, crucially, keeping themselves safe both online and offline. And that then provides the basis for relationships and sex education at secondary school where pupils are taught the facts around sex, sexual health and sexuality, set firmly within the context of relationships. We do need to strike the right balance. We don't want teaching to inadvertently fast-track children into engaging in or exploring adult activities rather than enjoying childhood being children. To teach young people about same-sex relationships does not mean teaching our children in primary schools about sex. It should focus on teaching children that society consists of a diverse range of people, that families come in many shapes and sizes, and that it is all right to be different. Some children in the classroom may, of course, have lesbian or gay or transgender family members and will rightly want to feel included in lessons about positive, healthy, trusting relationships. And crucially, if this content is not covered in the classroom, it doesn't mean that children are not going to come into contact with it. And most frequently, they will either turn to their peers, or don't even have to turn to their peers, they will get it from their peers when they turn to them, or from the internet. And as I think we all know, that can be, and my honourable friend from Carl Shulton and, War and Wallington reiterated, that can be a dangerous and distorted place. The RSHE... Statutory guidance is clear that it's for schools to decide at what point in their pupils' education it's appropriate to cover content related to LGBT. I will. Thank you, my friend. 18 months ago, when I was very briefly in the department of DfE, I did raise this with um, the civil servants, my concerns from constituents um, not being able to see the actual materials and only being shown the summary. I was reassured then that um, all schools would be emailed and said that materials must be shown to um, parents if it's requested. 
it wasn't done at the time when, when I was there. Would, could the Minister confirm if, if it's been done since? Um, Mr Dowd, it, it has, and I, and I will come uh, later in my remarks to, 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 those, to those very matters. As I was saying, the RSHE statutory guidance is clear that it's for schools to decide uh, the, point at which, the point in their pupils' education in which, at which it is appropriate to cover matters related to LGBT. I will. Um, I, I, I really thank the Minister for both his speech, um, but also all the work that he's done in this area. But one of the things which um, I find increasingly frustrating is, I believe it's by September 21, um, all schools were meant to have the necessary training. Because I think what we're hearing today is concerns that some children, some apologies, some teachers are not equipped and therefore they may be drawing on their personal experiences or whatever but without giving every teacher the training you are leaving them somewhat exposed Minister. I, I do recognise uh, questions around training. I, I, in truth it's also the case I'm afraid that you can't just say well if only everybody if only there were more training none of these issues would arise. That, that just isn't the way and it's always it's always a thing that obviously one, one looks at, but I do recognise those issues, and also the related issues about, uh, about materials and quality of materials, and I will, I will touch on both of those things a wee bit later. I won't read that sentence again, which I've done twice now, but I will just say that it means that uh, that point about deciding the point at which means that primary schools have discretion over whether to discuss sexual orientation or uh, families with same-sex parents. Indeed, Earlier, the Honourable Lady from Rotherham outlined what the statutory guidance uh, does uh, say. And it is in the context, when we talk about LGBT in primary school, it is in that context of relationships and in particular families. It, so it says, families of many forms provide a nurturing environment for children. And families can include, for example, single parent families, LGBT parents, Families he headed by grandparents, adoptive parents, foster parents or carers, among other structures. There is no statutory content on LGBT in the primary curriculum tables. Uh, similarly, it's for primary schools to decide whether to teach any sex education. The RSHE guidance does not provide a definition of what relationships and sex education should include, but it is clear that it should be tailored to the age and the physical and emotional maturity of the pupils. It should ensure that both boys and girls are prepared for the changes that adolescence will bring. Primary schools that do teach sex education must set out the details of what they will teach in their relationships and sex education policy on which they must consult uh, in advance with uh, parents. Secondary schools should provide an equal opportunity to explore the features of stable and healthy same-sex relationships and ensure this content is integrated throughout the relationships and sex education curriculum. We trust our teachers to deliver this context, content in a suitable and age-appropriate way, respecting the beliefs and values of all pupils in the school. Our guidance says that schools are free to determine uh, how they cover LGBT-related content and, I uh, quote, we expect all pupils to have been taught LGBT content at a timely point uh, uh, as part of this area of the curriculum. The majority of teachers, of course, do this, uh, do this well and adapt to the circumstances of their pupils. Uh, now, some people may feel that covering LGBT matters contradicts tenets of their uh, faith. And I am conscious that faith, religious faith is itself a protected characteristic. But schools with a religious character can teach the distinctive faith perspective uh, on relationships and pupils should be able to have a balanced debate about issues that are uh, contentious. A good understanding of pupils' uh, faith backgrounds and positive relationships between the school and local faith communities help to create a constructive context for the teaching of these subjects. Religions teach tolerance and respect and these subjects are designed to help children from all backgrounds and all faiths to build positive and safe relationships. Now, we worked uh, closely with the Catholic Education Service, the Church of England, the Board of Deputies for British Jews, and the Association of Muslim Schools on uh, the support for implementing the, uh, the curriculum. 
And I know that some of these organisations uh, develop their own materials that align the new curriculum with their faith perspectives. There's no reason why teaching children about the society that we live in and the different types of loving, healthy relationships that exist cannot be done in a way that respects everyone. Now, I know also that some parents, and it came up uh, earlier from my honourable friend, some parents are frustrated that they cannot withdraw their pupils from relationships education as opposed to sex education, uh, as they believe the boundaries can be blurred with uh, sex education where there is uh, right from which there is rightly uh, a right for a child to be withdrawn. And I do recognise those, I do recognise those uh, sensitivities. Uh, I recognise that parents are the first educators of their children and may want to withdraw their child from lessons so they can first discuss uh, some topics with their child outside of school. I also believe that all pupils should be taught about caring friendships and respectful relationships and they need to understand how to keep themselves and others safe and what to do when they feel unsafe. It's important that parents know what their child will be taught in advance of it being delivered in the classroom, which is why, um, uh, which is why there is a requirement on schools to publish uh, the relationships or relationships and sex education policy, and schools must consult with parents as they develop and renew that policy. Um, there has been concern, and it's come up again today, over materials that some organisations have prepared to teach relationships and sex education in schools. Um, it is for schools to make decisions about what materials uh, to use and their responsibility to ensure that what is being taught is safe and age appropriate. Now, and just for clarity, it's probably worth just reiterating that in our school system, and this has long been the case, it is schools that decide what materials they use for everything. Uh, we don't have a top-down system where um, some Mandarin decides this is the textbook for such and such a subject and everybody learns from that. There has always been... Uh, this diversity and sometimes that creates you know challenges but also actually I think it is a strength of our it is a strength of our of our system having that uh, having that diversity but parents must have confidence um, uh, that it is safe and age appropriate and we believe that transparency is the best indeed the only way to be absolutely uh, sure of that uh, so it is essential uh, that parents know what are, what are being, what's being taught in the classroom and the resources that are being used. Now, my honourable friend from Carl Sholton and Wallington was absolutely correct when he said that those requirements are already set out uh, and clear, but, be, but following concerns expressed about things like uh, you know, barriers because of copyright, uh, which, had, which had come up, the Secretary of State has now written twice uh, to all schools to remind them of the responsibility uh, to make available uh, materials including uh, relationships education materials where parents uh, want to see them and that copyright law does not prevent them from doing that uh, and we will ensure that the content of these letters is reflected in the revised RSHE statutory guidance when it comes out to to, I will The department's written to the schools, and I've got evidence that the schools are ignoring this guidance. Would the department write to the producers of this literature and tell them their responsibilities? Because there are fewer of, of them than there are the schools, and I think that's probably the best way forward with this until we actually uh, completely review what we're teaching our children and before, hopefully, um, we get in place uh, a full right to withdraw from our SHE materials. Well, I am going to, I'm going to come on in, uh, in a moment to, uh, to, 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 ma to materials. Um, well, in fact, I'll, I'll do it now. We, we think it is right that there is a, it's a good thing that there is a diversity of materials to support all subjects. And I mentioned earlier, I mean, some, there are some religious organisations, for example, that produce materials to support RSHE, as there are many others, you know, commercial organisations and, and so on. Um, We've also committed, also we haven't committed, Oak National Academy has committed uh, to produce materials to support in the teaching of RSHE uh, in, in the future. Oak is a significant investment from government to, um, it's not to, to replace 
other sources, but as a, uh, you know, as a trusted, um, and actually also times from a teacher's point of view, time-saving uh, uh, perspective uh, to, to produce those materials. But what we don't do is get involved in the production or indeed in the kind of gateway uh, uh, as a gatekeeper of, of materials. Uh, and we work with Oak either. They will do that independently. Uh, our relationship is with the schools, the 22,000 schools we have in this country and the trust and the local authorities that they are part of, and they make decisions, the schools make the decisions about what to, about what to teach with. But, and I say it again, we think that the surest guarantee uh, in this area is absolute transparency. That, that, is, that is the most important thing to have for everybody's confidence, everybody's confidence uh, in, in this system. And as I said, that is in the, what the Secretary of State has already written to schools and will also be reflected uh, in the new guidance when it, when it comes out. I'm going to go to our Honourable Friend from Darlington. Peter Gibson, I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way, and I just wonder if you could provide just a little bit of clarity. In the situation where a school seeks to distribute and share the information it's going to use in its classes with parents and the provider of that information refuses permission and consent to the school to do so, is it, your view, is it the Minister's view that the school should and could legitimately terminate that contract with that provider? I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to start commenting on commercial contracts, but I will say that in that or any other circumstance, if a parent wants to see what their child is seeing in relationships and sex education, yes, they should be able to do so. Absolutely. My honourable friend. Thank you Fletcher. For, for, for giving way, and I thank the honourable member from Darlington for his, um, his comment there. As I say, we, we do agree on certain things, don't we? And it's, uh, it's important that we, we come together on this. It's a similar question that if the parents see this material and they are not happy with material, and I have a folder full of it here, thousands of schools have seen this, and they're not happy with it, what redress do they have? What can they do from that point forward? And what if the school will not listen? Well, in my experience, schools do listen. Schools want to listen to, they want to be in, uh, you know, in communion with their, commun their community, uh, the parents uh, at the school. I'm not in the business of trying to, uh, trying to create conflict or encourage conflict we want people to to talk uh, and in my experience you know you can't legislate for everything you can't say that there is no circumstance in which an unsatisfactory outcome will pertain but it is my firm belief that by people talking to each other trying to understand one another uh, actually as as a general rule uh, sensible ways forward can be found and again I say that transparency is the key un is the key underpinning of that because if you don't have transparency you will always you always risk not having trust in what is actually in what is actually happening. Um, and Mr. Dow, to further strengthen the uh, the content in the RSHE statutory guidance, the Secretary of State also brought forward uh, the well, sorry, not also she did bring forward the review of the guidance and and also appointed an independent expert panel to advise to advise on what ages. Uh, at what ages sensitive topics in the curriculum should be taught. We've also invited parents into the department to share their experiences of school engagement and access to RSH, RSHE materials. We're currently working through recommendations and expect to have revised statutory guides out for public consultation at the earliest opportunity. We're looking at how to be clearer about the distinctions between the subjects and the content taught in each to support decisions about whether to withdraw children, including uh, from relationships education, and we will consult on those changes. All parents and other interested parties will have the opportunity, of course, to present their thoughts on the curriculum when the revised RSHE statutory guidance is published for consultation. Now, Mr Dowd, we know that young LGBT uh, people are more likely to be bullied, they're more likely to be discriminated against, uh, and more likely to suffer with mental ill health. And the department's school omnibus survey of 2017 showed that after gender, uh, being or being perceived to be LGBT is one of the main reasons that uh, pupils uh, face, uh, face bullying. Keeping children safe in education is, as you know, the statutory guidance that all schools and colleges 
must have regard to when carrying out their duties to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. Amongst other things, the guidance sets out how schools should protect children from harm and what to do if they have concerns about a child. In addition, all schools have to comply with relevant requirements of the Equality Act 2010 and must ensure topics in RSHE are taught in a way which does not discriminate against pupils or amount to harassment. Over a period of three years, the department provided three million pounds to fund five anti-bullying organisations to support schools to tackle bullying. And this includes projects targeting bullying of particular groups, such as those who are victims of hate-related bullying uh, or homophobic bullying. The Anne Frank Trust has developed a different but the same project and supported nearly 80,000 young people, their teachers and schools, to tackle bullying focused on protected uh, characteristics. And colleagues, including the Honourable Gentleman uh, from Sheffield Central and my Honourable Friend, again from Carl Sholton and Wallington, raised uh, the topic, the important topic of uh, mental health in young people. And to support the mental health of pupils, we've committed to offer all state schools uh, and colleges a grant to train a senior mental health lead by 2025, enabling, enabling them to introduce <coughs> effective whole school approaches to mental health and well-being. And as at December last, uh, 15,000 settings have claimed a, gr a grant, including more than seven in 10 state-funded secondary schools. The department is also expanding the mental health and well-being support for school and college leaders and from April uh, this year we'll begin funding a three-year mental health and well-being support package. Um, on the different but obviously related uh, subject of gender questioning and the gender questioning guidance, um, our consultation on that as you will know uh, Chairman has recently closed and we will publish the government response to the consultation alongside the guidance itself in the coming months. But what I want to reiterate here uh, today is that the safety and well-being of children will always be our primary concern, which is, which is why it is at the heart of that guidance. The new RSHE curriculum has been taught in schools for less than four years, and we do want to know what parents think, what teachers think, and, of course, what pupils think. Our public consultation will give everyone the opportunity uh, to, to do that. Uh, but in addition, we've sought the views of school leaders, teachers and pupils through an independent research project which has undertaken quantitative and qualitative research to look at how useful the statutory guidance is, the challenges in implementing it, pupils' engagement and teachers' confidence in delivering it. The final report will be published shortly and support the review uh, process. Mr Dowd, the government understands that parents are the primary educators of their children and some will want to preserve, or will want to preserve the innocence of childhood until they feel the time is right to teach them about the society in which they are growing up. These children are our future business owners, they're our future doctors, our future dentists and our future politicians. And they need to understand and respect the diverse population of the country in which we live, and the RSHE curriculum is there partly to help them to do just that. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. And can I uh, thank you, the petitioners, uh, and of course every colleague who has contributed today. I will not take us through to half past seven. You'd be happy to, uh, <laughs> happy to know. <laughs> um, but uh, can I thank the minister for his considered response and for the calm way that we have held this debate uh, this afternoon. Uh, just, just to reiterate, as the member for Brighton Kemp Town said, um, it is important that we know about uh, healthy but boring, although boring is never an adjective I'd use to describe the member for Brighton Kemp Town, um, despite many other things that we may call each other. Um, but there is nothing extreme about knowing that different people exist and different kinds of healthy relationships exist. I look forward to the government engaging with all stakeholder groups as part of the RSE review because it is clear from pupils, teachers and parents who have engaged so far in the short time that RSC, mandatory uh, RSE has been on the statute book, um, that there is a need to review this. I think it's a good thing to review these policies uh, and a good thing to keep them up to date. Uh, but it's clear from the teachers, pupils um, and from parents that there is dissatisfaction uh, about how it's being implemented or not being implemented. And there's clearly a lot still to work through, as we'd expect with anything going through a teething process uh, like new guidance like this. So I look forward to that. Um, I look forward to engaging with the government on that. But I don't want to 
pertain us for any longer. So, uh, Mr. Dowd, I beg to move the motion. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 630932 and 631529 relating to G LGBT con content and relationships education. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order, the sitting stands adjourned. Thank you. Good. Thanks for that. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. ParliamentLive.tv ParliamentLive.tv
parliamentlive.tv.